next session will be uh, the multi-sensor fusion hub by uh, Fabian from Accent. So it's my colleague, um, and I'm excited about uh, to hear what he's going to tell us. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, let us know. You can do it during the uh, during the session, after the session. And uh, for now, I want to give the word to Fabian. Fabian, can you uh, uh, unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera and share your screen and uh, let us hear what you uh, what you got to tell us? Is the yeah. is the presentation yeah. visible? Yeah. Okay. Perfect then. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, also thank you for the introduction, Oscar. And also welcome to all the listeners uh, listening to this presentation at the moment. Um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the idea of the multi-sensor fusion hub. But at first of all, I want to start with a small introduction about the company and about myself a bit. I want to then go further on basically to recap quickly some challenges in, in the positioning or in the navigation. I want to highlight the importance of dead reckoning using basically IMUs. And uh, last but not least, I want to close the talk by outlining our vision for indoor positioning also in warehouse environments. So what about Movella and Xen? So Movella was founded in the year 2009 under, under a different name at that time. And uh, later on acquired Xen in uh, uh, 2017. Xsense by itself was uh, founded in the year 2000 in Enschede in the Netherlands, very close uh, to a university here, and was also founded by, by two former students. And up to today, we keep this close collaboration with the university here. And since Movella also acquired further companies, we are now basically have really a full stack basically reaching from from low-end low hardware solutions to basically up to cloud analytic solutions um, for using that sensor data. Until this moment, or up to the moment, we have a little bit more than 250 employees. And we have, of course, what, def what defines us is basically that we uh, try to give meaning to motion, and we have also some patterns in this domain. Um, we are present all over the globe with in total nine offices. Um, one of the biggest one, I think, is still here in Enschede. Um, but yeah, we are also present in all other, on all, all other continents besides, and not all other. I want to correct that, but yeah, I'm sure that we have channel partners on all continents. Um, and what extends in particular is uh, specializing in is basically sensor fusion, which means that we take mostly um, inertial data, so coming from a gyroscope and an accelerometer, and we fuse it with additional data to get uh, more information or to get more meaning out of this data. And these sensors can be a magnetometer, GNSS we use a lot in outdoor applications, a barometer as well, or in particular for altitude and height updates. And then everything goes into our sensor fusion engine. And with this output, we mainly serve two applications or two big applications. But in, the, in one, we are using typically a network of inertial sensors to, um, to estimate the human motion. So like you see here, a person is wearing a suit and then they, and then, um, and then we, and then we can estimate and um, the original motion of the skeleton. And for the single sensor case, we typically estimate um, directly the, the orientation, position, or velocity of, a, of this single sensor entity. And it's, of course, also more useful for, in particular, industrial applications. And uh, this is also the product series we are going to talk about a little bit more today. But still, I want to address that we basically have like, I split our business into these three business lines, two focusing a little bit more on the human motion part um, with entertainment and health and sports, even though they have a little bit of different focus. 
and the industry section focusing on single sensors and specifically on embedded low power um, sensors. Um, about myself and uh, why I also have the pleasure basically to talk to you today. So I'm since quite a time basically very enthusiastic about uh, sensor fusion in general, in particular for robotic application. And actually everything started a little bit working at, uh, during my bachelor thesis, working at big uh, sensor intelligence in Hamburg at the time, where I was looking uh, into using natural landmarks in warehouses from 2D range data for localization. In my master thesis, I, I was able to, to work with the data from this nice robot uh, called Spencer, which was driving around uh, Schiphol Airport um, to, to work on people tra tracking, especially in very crowded scenarios. And my PhD thesis is about moving from horizon estimation for inertial motion tracking, which was already a collaboration with Xsense. And since 2020, I'm also a research engineer at Xsense or Movella, working on the sensor fusion algorithm day by day. So let's start basically with the idea of the multi sensor fusion hub, which after this uh, conference is definitely not completely new to you because there, there might be some small overlap. But let's recap first some challenges. So first, we want to typically solve some challenging applications indoors. And uh, the problem is that also this, the, this environment indoors can be very different and very challenging by itself. And just to give very little examples, one of course is the repetitiveness of structures. Another thing is changing light conditions in in different, um, in different, especially in in environments where there is a lot of glass. Then, of course, we have like just a complete um, different, um, yeah, an uh, an empty warehouse versus a filled look warehouse can look look completely different just by um, moving a lot of static objects around. And then, of course, we all aim to basically for a future where robots interact more and safe with humans. And then, of, of course, we have also a lot of dynamic objects into this in the scene, which could be either controlled if it is other robots or humans, um, which are then, of course, uncontrolled. And we see that a lot of different sensor solutions are used to basically solve the problem overall. And just to recap, really, uh, a few of them is really just um, so one would be to try to perceive the environment, similar as we do with our eyes, um, with vision or LiDAR sensors, and use this information. But also, radar sensors could be a, a possibility here. We could perceive an additional infrastructure which helps us in localization. Ultra wideband, would there be an example? RFID text for or feedout shields for this grid localization Tom, uh, Thomas already mentioned before, or even like upcoming um, features in Wi-Fi or 5G networks. And typically also we rely basically on uh, lower end sensors really deep integrated into the system itself, which could be like encoders and sensors. And yeah, many of you know Xsense probably, and you know that we have typically facing on inertial measurement units, or as we, we call them, motion trackers. But why should we basically use these motion trackers? And, and for what are they currently used? So first, to recap a little bit what, our, what they are doing, especially for indoor applications, we've used accelerometer, gyroscope measurements, and magnetometer. And we give with that an output of the orientation. And we can split this basically in an inclination angle, meaning like the vertical reference with respect to gravity, for example. And we can also estimate like a heading or yaw angle, which could be either uh, referenced with respect to north or referenced with, referenced with respect to the initial pose. And some applications we already see in indoor robotics where our sensors are used are, of course, like the heading control, especially for the grid localization approaches to maintain the right heading to, to get to the next grid space, let's say. Um, 
and then to be able to place the grid a little bit further apart than maybe necessary without using an IMU. We have, of course, like in um, a fall over protection, like also even like in cars are sometimes used when we, that for sharp uh, turns, for example, a robot is not falling directly over. And we also see some interesting use cases where they actually use an IMU to estimate loads or basically to prevent overloading. But my personal opinion is like this goal doesn't go, go far enough for me because I think also it is really um, important basically to use the, the feature of integrating acceleration and angular velocity data to actually do velocity and precision that reckoning. And I think this, this feature of IMUs is very important because at the end, like with this, we get at each uh, instant of time very good, or we can get very good predictions. And since a lot of SLAM algorithms and so on uh, depend on iterative solvers, good predictions can also solve time as can save time at the end in convergence. Um, also, an IMU is a very, um, uh, since it is very high, highly sampled, it can give very fast feedback in terms of different motions. And uh, that reckoning can also then allow us later on to reject actually outliers of other different sensing sources. And even in the worst case, if there would be like while driving basically a system fail failure or so, an IMU can be so low level that it can also help help really at the end to to um, stop the system safely and robustly without um, hurting material or or people and that's why i think basically like that um, an imu can really represent uh, the necessary backbone for uh, precise but moreover really robust positioning uh, in indoor environments and i want to motivate this with an outdoor case um, with an outdoor example where we basically also rely on this dead reckoning feature. And there I want to introduce very quickly a, a different sensor. So again, we have like the IMU data, we have magnetometer data and barometer data at relatively high rate. And we've used this data with GNSS data at four hertz, uh, coming in with four hertz, so at a lot lower rate. And um, if we look, for example, at this situation here, um, we are coming basically from the bottom and you see the blue circles are representing the, the raw GNSS information or basically the GNSS precision estimate. And we enter basically this panel and of course, since there is no reception, the, the, the signal cuts, it's also expected, it's not really a problem. But what a really interesting thing is happening at outside, uh, coming outside of the panel again, where the GNSS actually thinks that it estimates the right position. But due to some high build, higher buildings there at the exit, for some reason, it basically has this huge, huge offset. And we see also, and the lines which are plotted here are in principle the outputs of our sensor. And we see, depending on how we fine tune or how we basically use uh, that reckoning in our outlier rejection mechanism, we basically get different uh, trajectories. So following basically doing no outlier rejection at all. Um, uh, we will just follow the GNSS measurements as we see. But basically we can like recover the original street trajectory by using clever um, our, the, the dead reckoning and in particular the growing of the uncertainties which are connected basically with the, with the dead reckoning. What helps us here is also that we can use in some parts again the velocity measurements because despite the having wrong positions there, the velocity measurements were quite stable. Um, but very crucial in this application or using that reckoning is really, or what we noticed is really a good understanding of uncertainty, which I think we have here at as well. So basically, what are the learned lessons from our case looking also to indoor positioning? It is really difficult to say in advance basically where uh, difficult situations might arise because we also for the same session we went to uh, um, Rotterdam to really expect the issue of uh, typical urban canyons with its high buildings 
but we did not see, not have a problem at all. But then looking, if going to Hengelo or just the neighboring city just next door, and you see it doesn't, it does look relatively harmless, but the combination of uh, several small challenges creates here a very difficult situation for us, which we needed to handle and which we were able to handle at the end as well. And um, besides that, we also saw really the advantage of using like RTK measurements, which, which gave us very accurate measurements, which we could also get, for example, from these nice LiDAR scanners and so presented just early on. And these can really help us to also online improve the estimation of the IMU parameters and then basically um, make the dead reckoning even more accurate and then therefore more reliable in the long term, uh, helping basically the, the, the accuracy of the state at the estimate. But of course, by incorporating such high accurate um, estimates or measurements, it's also important that like a lot of other system parameters are very well known. So what is our vision in terms of the indoor positioning? We do, um, we want to basically further increase the dead reckoning performance and make people really rely on this, um, on the dead reckoning performance of our sensors. So, and we start basically since we also calibrate our sensors in house on different temperatures, we really start basically on the, from the calibration and it will basically benefit like the whole pipeline. We will there basically um, go to a different um, algorithmic framework, which allows us uh, to, to calibrate the sensor more precise and gives them also more benefit than it like to online estimation features. We will also focus still since there, there will be some challenges in terms of estimating like um, system parameters like uh, offsets between the difficult the specific mounted sensors and so on. We will also like work hard on de delivering their nice tools for that to estimate them. And then of course we want to increase further on the, the actual benefit from incorporating these accurate aiding measurements like I call them to, to um, so that the IMU data even benefits more by adaptive um, models, for example, but also new algorithmic features like the moving horizon estimation I mentioned before. And if we look like our, at the, our vision in like a block diagram, it more or less currently looks like this for a GNSS receiver. So we have the GNSS receiver, it's sending its uh, measurements to the IMU or to the motion tracker, which uses an IMU magnetism and barometer, and then all goes in our um, uh, sensor fusion engine at the end, giving like the output for orientation, position, and velocity. And we want to basically replace this uh, st relatively strict connection currently with basically like the possibility to connect different um, uh, sensor sources and different aiding information into our basically an estimation engine. And since we saw that also some sensors are really um, producing a lot of data, it might also become necessary in some points basically to actually introduce some surrogate processors um, to, um, to allow the, the computation of everything. But uh, also our sensor will then still take, 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 try to take care of estimating delays caused by that but of course, it is always nice to know as much as possible in advance. And, uh, and yeah, also, since we also aim to go to further and fully fledged uh, SLAM approaches at the end, we also think about using surrogate processes, of course, at the end of our estimation um, engine or yeah, on our sense of fusion engine, so that a little bit, especially at the beginning, we will try to give uh, to uh, give solutions which are as um, uh, as much as embedded as possible, but especially like in a, in a, the first steps, we m might also like uh, work there with um, surrogate processors, and these are also of course always spots for for integrators to actually deliver or yeah create their own IP on these nodes. 
And just for the sake of today's webinar, that a possible setup could look like this, where we basically have a SIG sensor running there, and then if you might use some SIG software even on one of the on one of NVIDIA now to actually get data. We get this nice uh, 128 channel or so on data from our Auster sensors, and also as a magnetic as some um, some encoders for for more low level control and everything goes into the motion tracker and it's then uh, um, first basically prepared and then partly solved on an NVIDIA uh, embedded processor, for example, like a Jetson or something like that. And of course, we want also to focus and facilitate the, even in the, like the integration within uh, within ROS so that all these things uh, can run in ROS besides basically some surrogate uh, applications on the embedded processor itself. And that is in principle like our vision at Xsense, like how we would like to continue with indoor positioning. And that's already also the end of my talk. And I'm looking forward to your questions now. All right, thank you, uh, Fabian. Um, I'll take over the screen again. Let me see. This one, and I just need to click, and then we are here on the Q and A again. Uh, thanks for the clear presentation. We have some questions coming in uh, at the moment, but also that came in uh, during the session. Um, so first of all, how does this idea slash concept integrate with SLAM algorithms? Well, um, so at the current stage, we basically don't, we will not try directly to. Uh, have our own SLAM algorithms running on our sensors, but rather basically um, see it, we see it rather as a tool to stabilize SLAM and basically um, make it also easier in terms of SLAM in terms of conversion. So basically the, the SLAM algorithm would be running outside of the loop and giving it, it's currently, it's current or no, the, the estimate of the previous time step as an input to our sensor, um, in uh, which then basically would like give a better prediction for the next time step. And also we want basically not to restrict ourselves in terms of SLAM technology because yeah, it really depends a little bit um, what, what SLAM approach we use. We also collaborate like on magnetic field SLAM um, with the University Delft and now the light goes out. Uh, yeah, and in principle, there is that there will be like a continuous development on that. So at the beginning, it will be just the SLAM output of your uh, proprietary SLAM algorithm will be the input. And later on, we will also try to work more and more towards a full fledged uh, SLAM solution as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, a question regarding, uh, I think, the, the part also you mentioned about uh, outdoor and, and GNSS. Which uh, sensor is redundant other than the IMU plus RTK GNSS for the accurate positioning of the vehicle in case of unavailability of entrap entro or course network from telecom industry within a country? Ah, okay, so this is now really specific, like, of course, to the to the outdoor uh, case with the GNSS RTK, of course, yeah. the indoor this will be not really available. Um, so, it is. Uh, can you repeat once the the second part, please, of the question again, Oscar? Or can I read it somewhere? Um, let me see if I can forward it to you. Um, you should be able to see it now. But uh, again, which uh, sensor is redundant other than the R IMU plus RTK GNSS for the accurate positioning of the vehicle in case of unavailability of an entrip or course network from telecom industries uh, industry within the country? Uh, I think what really would help, I also like, I think what the person is really asking also in terms of basically entrip failures at the end and uh, what can happen in these situations. And I think also there the multi-sensor fusion hub idea can actually help a lot because it would also facilitate easily to include, for example, encoder information into the estimate. 
which then could ha help like in these situations over over quite long distances, of course, depending always on the dynamics and the accuracy of the model and sensors used. But this could at least like bridge really the 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 the, the um, this this time where basically entry would not be available. And a similar thing holds for 5G. So basically, like also the sense of fusion hub idea would also allow then easily an integration of basically a 5G based localization method. And then you are again like um, uh, safe, uh, more safe in terms of positioning and you have less problems with your system operating outdoors. I hope I answered that question. Well, to the, to the, to the person who asked. I think so. And otherwise, we will see uh, another question coming in. Um, do you have plans for multi IMU integration to ensure redundancy? Yes, actually, that is uh, one of the first test cases, of course, like even like for the multi sensor fusion app, which is, of course, easy for us also to obtain by just like also to see like the scalability in terms of uh, data rates and so on, that we just uh, increase um, the number of sensors there on our on. Uh, as input, so instead of like now I present it basically with LIDAR and so on, but of course an alternative would be also just to use actually an XN sensor with its IMU data again as input to the sensor fusion hub idea. Mm. And um, this is actually what we will do, and uh, also, and it, like we really want to test it first and then we see if we actually go to this approach also in other designs. We all, we discussed sometimes about it. But yeah, so far we don't have products using basically multiple I well that's actually not true. So, I, so we if we don't really yeah sometimes there might be multiple IMU sources already in one of our IMU. Yeah and some in some cases our customers uh, simply do it. Uh, and use uh, multi or uh, yeah, use multiple of our sensors to create their redundancy. Um, yeah. Um, are your systems suitable for dynamic and static applications? Well, yes, I would uh, guess so. It of course, like in this, in this, it always. Yeah, they are, I think in principle we would need to discuss the. Uh, more, more in detail uh, what accuracies basically are needed. Of course, since we use MEMS um, uh, IMUs, we are often, we have a little bit to tackle the drift over times of these sensors. But in general, and also in particular with using an external update source, I see no, no reason why it cannot be used for static application as well. Despite that, I, of course, I find the dynamic case more interesting. All right. Um, and uh, your IMUs, do they two day or three day? Three D, sorry. Well, we are always solving basically the the, the full fledged full um, uh, motion tracking problem in three dimensions, um, uh, because it is also, yeah, just that there are too many things that basically you cannot really reduce the problem to two D, even though it would be sometimes actually nice. But it doesn't mean that basically, like also as an input to a fusion hub, that some 2D models might be actually used in the longer term as an input to basically the fusion hub. Can um, the sensors be used for um, drones in inside warehouses uh, in inventory management? Uh, there, of course, we always have to see, like at the end, like in terms of, uh, you see also that this is a very open approach and I cannot basically, in principle, I say from our sensors, definitely yes. But like, of course, there's, there are other components which make like a system heavy, but depending on like the, I think that's also like one of the ideas that basically with this approach that we should be able to develop basically an, a system for State as helping to to use state estimation for any application and uh, with its own requirements. So it's definitely an idea. And from our IMU specifications, I don't see a problem at all. Why not to use it for drones? 
All right. Um, yeah. Does your IMU provide strap down integration model? I'll ask, uh, I don't know what you mean directly, what the, what the question, uh, the person who asks means with model, but of course we, our, our IMU relies heavily on strap down integration. Okay. Are we looking into, or are you looking into uh, having a heave output signal, a signal from uh, the sensor? Well, that's actually a very interesting uh, thing, and I think it's also with, uh, yeah, it was also one thing uh, which is quite already sometime I think on one of our on one of on the list of of ours, but also and. Yes, I definitely say yes here. And I think also this idea, this architecture of change for us will also facilitate and uh, like especially these additional output sources and integration of models. So it, it, this whole thing is also, it really goes on all sides. It should really facilitate development for us inside to basically just get faster to new solutions, but it should also basically um, allow uh, you, the listeners, or the integrators of our sensors, to basically ease your work with our systems and get actually still um, create still valuable IPs, switch sensing sources, and so on, and making the system more mature. But it's definitely a thing we plan to the okay. heat output. Right. One final question then, and the, the other questions uh, will be answered uh, later. But um, I don't know if you can answer that for for all product lines, but which line of your of your IMUs can produce a trigger signal for hardware synchronization? Is that a, is that a general uh, uh, answer for all product lines that we have? Or well, in, to be honest, to my knowledge, and I am there a little bit out out of my comfort zone because, of course, I work on the algorithms and I use the sensors, but I also um, don't know all technical designs, but to my knowledge, basically the whole MTI family is uh, exposing trigger signals. So basically yeah. ranging from the smallest MTI one series to up to the highest. But I don't know, Oscar, if you even know there more than I. No, that, that, that's correct. That's also what I know. But, uh, okay. You are you're the, the expert here, so I uh, like to. Uh, ask the questions to you but we can uh, come up with a uh, wider answer to to that person um well fabian that uh, that's it for now thank you for your uh, for your presentation um yeah thanks a lot i think it was really clear so uh and yeah, then we can move on to the next session okay goodbye everybody yes thank you